Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another installment of our Inventor product demonstrations. My name is Cameron McKenzie, and today we're going to be looking at using our Inventor components, our Inventor assemblies, and starting to render them inside of 3ds Max. So a lot of you will want to have some form of um, product demonstrations when once you've designed your components, and though we have some um, presentation features available inside of Inventor. Sometimes they don't have the render realism that we want um, from our products themselves. And making use of 3ds Max, uh, which is available inside of the product design manufacturing collection, which a lot of you will have, uh, we've got the ability now to use our models that we've already created and start to create some really, really nice renders of those um, of those items of our products to make uh, use inside of uh, advertising campaigns or just to have it on our website or just to get, get an understanding of what textures work really well for our objects. Um, and rather than going and, and creating, um, especially for concepts, rather than going and, and creating your concept um, and actually making it physically and then having a, a quick look at how it will look in the real world, we've got the ability to go and, and run some rendering inside of a, a studio environment inside of 3ds Max. So just a bit on 3ds Max, um, it's predominantly used inside of the rendering and animation in world. So a lot of um, programs, whether they be uh, um, advertisements or in fact, some movies uh, use 3ds Max to get their rendering um, created and, and to start producing some um, videos out of the, the product itself. So it's got a lot of um, history with regards to the, the film and um, advertising industry. Uh, so it's really handy tool, really powerful tool, in fact, um, that we've got inside of our collection that we can make really great use of. So today we're going to be taking a quick look at um, an inventor perspective of, of taking our models from um, from inside of Inventor and pushing it straight into 3ds Max to get the biggest potential, the best potential out of um, this. So we're not going to take a deep dive into 3ds Max, uh, but we just want to have a look at it from the um, from the designer perspective as to how we as designers can go in and and take our product and get some really great effects. Um, and really great outputs out of 3ds Max and um, the different tools that are available for us during that particular process. So without any further ado, we'll go straight into the software. Um, so I'll just grab Inventor here very quickly. Um, and we can see that we've got this model now of this utility knife uh, that's been created inside of Inventor or inside of another product. And we've added extra finishings to it or, and pretty much just come in and assemble this model together. You can see in our browser, we've got six different um, components or different parts that make up this assembly. So really much a standard inventor part um, with regards to the design process, um, maybe a bit more surface finishing to, to what the, um, the final model, um, but we can see we've got a really nice part that we can come in and use. Um, and this can be as detailed as, as this uh, utility knife, or it can be just a, a, a nut and bolt if you wanted to um, get a really nice render of it. It doesn't matter really, as long as we've got the 3D geometry inside of Inventor, as you can see here. Um, essentially from here, all we really need to do is just save this as an assembly with 3ds Max being an Autodesk product. It can bring in a IAM file straight into its environment. Um, we could use other file formats as well if we're using step files and um, STL files and a whole lot of other um, file formats that we can bring into uh, 3ds Max as well. But in this case, we've just got this um, utility knife over here. So once we've got this all set up and we've, we've configured our assembly in the way we want to, we can hop over directly into 3ds Max. So I'll just grab it over here and open it up. And on your first opening, you'll see we've got these four um, viewports that we can see our model with. Um, and they've got the different um, perspectives from there. So we've got our top, front, left, and perspective view from here. Um, and essentially just from here, we've got a blank canvas that we can start to, apologies, the mic. Um, we've got our, um, our workspace that we can begin to make 
um, and put our components in and start to build up the scene that we want to either animate or use as a still image. So that's the main area that we've got in the middle there. We've got a whole lot of tools up at the top so we can undo, redo, um, pretty much like what we used to inside of Inventor. Uh, we've got the ability to group or link items together and unlink them as well. So items can act as one unit, almost like an assembly, I suppose, if you're looking at it from a um, Inventor perspective, where it manages to put everything in one group of items and you can move them around and, and have them um, behave as one solid unit. Um, we've got some selection options at the top, so we can either select just with a normal click um, on individual items, whether it be inside of our viewport or whether it be in the uh, browser on the left-hand side over here. Uh, we've also got the ability to search items by name by drawing a rectangular selection around them um, or using our window crossing selection um, from within um, within 3ds Max. And then we've got some um, editing options where we can move our object around, rotate it, scale it, and so on. And then a few other options as we go down the list. But what I do want to show you here is just how simple it is just to bring a inventor model into 3ds Max. So to do that, we can just go up to the top left into file where we'd usually find our import options um, throughout the Autodesk platform. And we can see 3ds Max is no different in this regard. So we've got our import option from inside here. And we just want to import our assembly directly into this section. So I've got mine on my PC, C drive demo, and inside of Inventor, I should have do, 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 my utility knife assembly model. You can see the file formats that we can grab from. So you, we've got FBX file, we've got native 3DS Max files, and a whole lot of other file formats that we can grab from. So these are all file formats that in that 3DS Max will be able to bring into itself and be able to import in. So if you do have any files in any of these formats, we've got the ability to grab them. I'm gonna keep this at all files, just so we got all formats and just grab my utility now from there. Give that a few seconds just to consider the geometry that's inside of that particular model. Um, and then we've got the ability to then decide how we wanting to bring that geometry into our current um, environment. So we've got the ability to import this either as body objects, so just as the single objects, as solid objects inside of uh, 3ds Max, or we can bring them in as meshes. So if we just want the external um, shell of the components, just as if they were surfaces, we've got the ability to bring them in as a mesh. And obviously any rounded corners will have the various um, faces um, to, to make up the mesh itself. Any um, assembly options, we can decide whether we want to ref reference any duplicate parts, whether we want to create any layers by materials and so on as we bring them in. Um, if we had a scene configured already, um, which is really one of the great ways of working inside of 3ds Max, once you've got the setup, you can just use the exact same scene every single time and bring in multiple different items. Um, we can actually use this option here to merge with the current scene. So if we had already configured our scene, we could just merge our object with the current scene. And therefore, we don't have to keep recreating this every single time. In this case, I'm going to completely replace my current scene because I don't have anything inside of it. But as you can see, we've got the ability to grab that there. And then we got the option in here to choose how our inventor files uh, which direction our inventor file um, keeps horizontal, uh, sorry, vertical. And we can choose whether we're using our X axes, Y axes, or Z axes. I believe it was the Y axes, should be okay. Yep. So you can see based on our UCS in the bottom left, we've got our Y axes pointing up, and that's the direction that I want for this particular item. So I'll just minimize this and go back into there and make sure that my Y axis is my vertical direction. If yours was, configured another way around, you'd obviously want to change that. Once we're happy with the selection, we can just hit OK. It'll think about that for a few more seconds and plot that straight into our environment now. We should now see we've got in the bottom right our perspective view. Top left, we've got our top view, we've got our front view, and we've got our left view of the component of the assembly. From here, we want to start um, creating the environment. We're going to go, as I say, for a very simple environment. This is the best way to kind of get the best out of it. 
You can configure this in any way you want. You can add any other geometry if you wanted to, but we're just gonna go and keep it nice and simple throughout this. So what we want to do for this one is we wanna create a quick studio environment that's gonna give a bit of a backdrop for the component itself at the moment. It's just floating in midair. Um, there's nothing around it to, um, to kind of ground the, the feel of the, uh, the render itself. So we want to make sure that we've got um, something in the background that we can kind of change the color of, change the texture of, just to give it some feel that it's in a real world environment. And to do so, we're essentially just gonna go in and take the, uh, according to the current view cube, the, um, or the current view name, um, we've got the front view, um, perhaps I want to rotate that around just so that it's not confusing because that's, in my opinion, not the front of the component. Um, so before I even go through that process, maybe I just want to quickly rotate my model around. Um, so I'll just use the normal controls. We've got them up here at the top. I've pointed them out at the beginning. I've got the ability to come in and use a select and rotate button. And if I select this component, currently they're all grouped together. So if I just select one item, it's going to grab all of them for me. So now I've got the ability to use the normal nodes to be able to rotate it around, considered almost like the, the free orbit inside of Inventor, where we've got the ability to rotate it around the X axes. We've got the ability to rotate it around the Z axes. And we've got the ability to rotate it around the Y axes using the different um, dials on the component itself. We can also rotate it in the perspective view if we wanted to, and you can see all three of those axes are available to us there. In this case, I really just want to rotate it from the top and make sure that my front view is aligned correctly. So I've got the ability just to grab this and rotate it using a single axis of rotation. I'm going to undo that very quickly because we've also got the ability at this moment in time to turn on our angle snapping. So if I click on that, you can see in brackets, A is the hot key for that. So if we tap A, it would give us angle snapping. And now if I do that exact same movement, you can see it's snapping at five degree increments. So I want to go and grab it at a 95 degree, uh, 90 degree angle, and it's now rotated nice and neatly for me. So that's perfect. Now my front view is exactly how I want that front view to look. Um, my left view is of the left of the component, the top and all of those are, are pretty much matched in my alignment that I wanted. So now I'm going to go back to select object to be my main tool that's currently active rather than rotate. Um, and now I could come in and select the individual items. From here, we're going to go start building up that environment again. So inside of 3ds Max, in order to add geometry to our environment, we'll go into the um, controls here on the right-hand side. And this is where we can come in and either add geometry, as you can see with a little plus button, or create geometry, um, whether that be a just physical solid object. Um, so we've got the ability to come in and, and create um, boxes, spheres, cones, almost like primitive shapes inside of Inventor, um, but they've got a few more available to them. We've also got the ability to create shapes where we've got the ability to come in and create lines, rectangles, circles, and all of the other shapes, but they will be the 2D shapes that we've got available to us. We've also got the ability in this section to create lights for the lighting of our environment and cameras and a few other extra features that we can come in and add, whether we're wanting some helpers or some space warps or some systems in the background working on the animation. And this is more um, down the line of um, actually creating animation and, and movement inside of the environment. So in this case, we want to go, we want to be in the create tab and we want to grab a shape and we just want to draw a line in our environment. So I'm going to use my line tool over there. Now I'm going to grab the left view because obviously we want to view our object from the front. Um, so I'm going to draw an environment around my, um, my component. So I'm going to start off with my line down near the bottom, more or less in line with the object. I can always tweak the positioning later on. Um, so I'm going to go and start off my line somewhere over there and just go straight across from that point. This is going to be creating it on the origin plane, if you consider it from an inventor's perspective again. So it's going to be creating it right at the origin. Um, and depending on the perspective we use, it's going to be creating it on there. And if I hold down shift on my keyboard, it's going to make sure that that line stays horizontal or vertical. So it's going to do some um, snapping, um, either vertical or horizontal snapping from there. So I'm going to go more or less keep that line um, 
equal sides of the uh, object itself. Click down to place the first node, and then I can go in and place a second node. Maybe I want to zoom out a little bit in this view and place the uh, the second point somewhere over there. And I would just want those two lines, uh, so third point, um, just those two lines, and we can then start to tweak that from there. Again, just starting with basic geometry and starting to build up from there. So if I now right click, it'll cancel that tool off for me. And I can see that this is pretty much still exactly where I want it to be. Um, and once we've got the basic shape, we can then start making tweaks to that shape. So um, with this being the backdrop that we want, we've got the floor and we've got the back um, of the environment. Um, but you'll notice that in most um, renders, we don't have sharp corners in the edges. You can, by all means, keep it with the sharp corner. Apologies for that again. Um, otherwise, we can also just start to curve that corner up um, and just so it's less sharp. And if we do see that back in the um, in the render itself, it's going to have a nice gradient um, fading um, from that back um, itself rather than just seeing a sharp corner that you would expect in, in a wall or something like that. So in order to edit that, you can see currently our line one is active. It's highlighted in our selection at the top there. So anything we change now will happen on that particular item. So from here, all we can, all we really need to do now is go over to the modification tab to be able to start to modify that particular item. So we've been in the create tab, we've created the geometry, we can go over to the modify tab um, and start to modify this line. So in the modifier list is a whole lot of different modifications that we can make to said line. Um, and again, we're just gonna use some basic tools. So we're used to using the chamfer tool or fillet tool inside of Inventor. So if we just start typing in fillet, you can see we've got the fillet chamfer option available to us. Now that will come in and select initially the first node, um, which is down there at, at the bottom, uh, that yellow one over there. I want to just grab that one over there. And I want to um, create a fillet on that particular node. We can see the radius is available here. And then for the chamfer, we've got a distance. In this case, again, chamfer. So I'm just going to grab this value and just drag it up. And you can see as I'm starting to drag that up, we're then getting a bit more curvature to that, um, that back plate, basically, as we go through. So we can decide how much of a chamfer we want or fillet we want. Um, I'm going to go for something, just eyeball it somewhere around there, 4.28. And that's fine from there. Um, after this, I want to then modify this even further. So I can go into the modifier list once more. And this time, I want to create an extrusion of that particular line. So we're taking our 2D shape and making it into a 3D shape. So we can come in here, um, set the amount of the extrusion we want. And you can see just by dragging this value once more, we've got the ability to come in and um, adjust the sizing of it. If I zoom out in one of these views, I can get an idea of how big this is going to be compared to my object. Maybe have it a little bit smaller, but we want it to be quite big. We want it to take up the entire backdrop, essentially, of our component. So have it somewhere around there, 35. Um, units in this particular case. We've also got the ability to come in and create segments. This basically creates a mesh for us um, or a surface model for us. So you can see the various segments that occur in the background. You can see the edges of them um, in the view at the moment, um, but we could come in and add segments along that extrusion as well if we wanted to, if we wanted to um, start doing some surface adjustments in that. But in this case, I just want a straight edge um, a straight extrusion all the way through. I don't want to make any tweaks to it necessarily. Once we've got that there, we can pretty much just click off of that. And you can see we've now got our two components. Uh, we've got our entire assembly there and we've got our backdrop over here. I might want to come in and tweak the positioning of this backdrop. So from my top view over here, I'm just going to use my move command and just drag it along the X and get my, um, my backdrop centered more or less. Um, around the um, the object that I want to have as my, my main um, focus. So we've got our perspective view down at the bottom right. I just want to realign that just to make sure that we've got um, access to that. Um, inside of 3ds Max, we use Alt rather than Shift to orbit around. So um, we can use Alt and our middle mouse button 
Um, so if we were coming from Inventor again, we'd reuse Shift in the middle mouse button in 3ds Max, it's Alt and the middle mouse button, but the rest of the controls are pretty much the same. So now we've got our environment more or less set up in the way we want to, um, minus a camera and a um, any lighting. Um, but for now, we want to go and um, just add some extra materials onto the various surfaces just to make sure that they are um, going to be rendering in the way we want it. Um, so this is where 3ds Max really thrives in the, um, the library it has of various materials. Um, we could theoretically use the inventor ones, but it's going to be a lot easier using um, 3ds Max native materials and starting to make tweaks to the appearances of those. So to go into our environment, we want to just tap M on our keyboard for materials, and we should see our material editor, our slate editor um, pop up over here. And you can see we've got various materials we can come in and grab. We can grab physical materials, blends, direct X shaders, and so on. Uh, we've got some Arnold materials as well that we can come in and grab. Um, we've got some atmospheric values as well um, and any maps in that but in this case we just want to um I'll just collapse each of those there just so we can see the, the full list um again keeping this nice and simple for for the sake of um, rendering directly out of inventor we're just going to grab a physical material and each physical material comes with various um settings so this um, slate works um, basically like a 2d canvas that we can come in and zoom in and out of we can expand this window but if we wanted to as well just so we got a bit more space um, but essentially, this is made up of various um, configurations, various settings that we can come in and adjust in here. So we've got the base weight, base color mapping, and a whole lot of other options from inside of this list. We'll also see most of those options um, in this um, little panel on the right-hand side here as well, where we can come in and change the base color, change any reflections of this particular material, um, change its transparency. We've also got the ability in here to um, change the way that, um, or the material um, that this particular item um, has associated to it, and also any finishing um, that you want to it. So how the, the texturing of this works. So not only can we change the coloring, but we can also then change the, the texturing um, based on certain presets. So in the finishes drop down over here, we've got the ability to go and grab a glossy paint or a satin paint or a matte paint or a varnish paint, We've also got various um, wood and concrete and granite and plastic that we can use here. We've got some metal type finishes that we can use as well. Um, so a lot of options that we can come in and grab here. Um, so just on that, we can just kind of establish what we're wanting to um, have out of our current render. So with our, um, with our utility knife in the background, we know that the, the main casing is probably going to be some form of a plastic. Um, so we can grab something that, that either has a bit of a plastic feel to it, um, or maybe just a, an, a really nice um, glossy paint, perhaps. Um, maybe we want a, a fairly shiny paint as well. So we've got various options, as I say, um, available here. Um, maybe I want to go for, for a nice uh, glossy plastic preset on this one. And then we've got the ability from there to set the coloring for it. So in this case, maybe the base color I want to set to, let's go for a nice uh, Mana Machine orange color. Let's go for somewhere around there. I can never remember the exact color that it is. Don't tell Ellie. Uh, somewhere around there. And just hit OK on that. It's more of a yellow, I suppose, in this particular one, but we'll ignore that for now. Um, and as part of this, we've got the ability to come in and choose how reflective it is. So we've got a, a ratio of reflectivity or, or a um, the ability to come in and set the amount of, of reflectivity um, from there and what color the reflection will want to lean towards. So we've got a fairly light color from there. We've also got the ability to come in and adjust the roughness of the surface. I want to bump that down ever so slightly just to be sure. Um, and we've got the ability to add a bit of metalness to it, a bit of a metal tinge to it as well um, during this particular process. Um, but that's pretty much the, the basic setup of that. Um, so I'm happy with that particular material. I can come in and give this a name. So I'm just going to come in in the name option up at the top there and just call this the plastic finish. and click off of that and you can see the name over there. I can collapse that if I wanted to, um, and that'll then grab that there. I can also 
select this item and um, I believe it is the, let me just grab that there. That's fine. Um, we can also then just grab and drop another material in because um, we want to obviously have a few other materials as part of this process to make it look really nice. Um, so the next material I'll grab is going to be a bit of a rubber feel for the handle or the, the grips of the component itself. We've got a nice um, fairly dark color here. Maybe I want to go a little darker. I want to go quite dark on that. Not all the way fully um, black on that one, but maybe just ever so slightly off. And I don't want any reflections on this at all, really. Um, or if I do, they want to be also fairly gray or, or darker on that particular item. We can really come in and start to make all of these um, tweaks to it. And if you wanted to, we've got various inputs that we can add into these values. So you'll see if I go and create another um, physical material now for the blade itself. Uh, let me just name this one rubber. And we're going to call this one the blade or metal. You can give this any name you want to, whatever works with your, your naming convention, just so you can understand exactly which one, um, what it, each of those point to essentially. Um, so in the finishes for this one, we want to go for a nice uh, metal, perhaps a, a bra brushed metal on this one. And you'll notice as soon as I select brushed metal over here, it adds a few inputs to each of those um, configurations. So for our base color mapping, they've got a, um, a mapping um, image that, um, that sets inside of there. So it's allowing it to add a bit of texture to that. And we can see that that output is going straight into the, the color mapping as well as the bump mapping. So it's adding a bit of texture. It's adding a bit of um, almost a, a physical feel to the component itself using that bump mapping. So the bump back mapping will make sure that certain areas um, are, look a little bit um, further out than others, um, allowing us to um, make it feel a little bit more physical. And you can see that that is um, grabbing it from, from that image on there. Um, and that's all being based off of a UVW mapping um, right from the top over there, going into different channels um, and making use of those. And we could have theoretically grab um, multiple other ones. We could grab a roughness mapping as well and, and put that straight into the roughness mapping, ensuring that the same texture that's being used for the base color and the bump mapping is also being used for the roughing or any of the other ones, or we can come in and add others along the way as well. But as for a preset, this is really handy to have. And I'm going to leave it as it is. I'm not going to make any changes to it. I'm going to keep everything as it needs to be um, for this particular one. And then the last one we've got um, is just the handle, or not the handle. It is the, according to the setup, it is the blade cradle. Um, so we want to have this one. It was initially blue, so I'm going to also have that a blue color. So I'm going to keep the same. Um, preset, let's just call this one um, cradle. And for my finishes, I'm going to grab the exact same, if I can find it again, glossy plastic, but this time rather than going orange, I'm going to go a nice deep blue for this one. So go somewhere there, and that could probably be a little deeper than that, something like that. Cool. Um, once we're happy with that, um, once we're happy with the configuration of our materials, you can come in and add more at a later point if you want to remove some and pretty much configure it in any way that you wanted to. I'm just going to minimize this ever so slightly off to the side and just make sure I can see all four of those materials that I want to use in my configuration. We've got the ability now to assign each of those materials to every single individual object inside of our scene. So we've got all of these items selected now. They're currently within a group. I can see that just by the little icon over there. So I want to ungroup all of them. Otherwise, I'm going to be making changes to everything all at once, which I don't want. Um, so I'm going to use this unlink selection. And we should now see that we've got the ability, should be able to, to um, select individual components inside of this group. Uh, unlink. He says, there we go. Uh, has it? I don't believe it has. Net as the group. Ungroup. There, that's better. Sorry, they were a group rather than linking. 
Um, so I can see all of the individual items now from here. So we've got our blade cradle that we want to make sure has that blue color to it. So I can then select this item in our scene, select the material inside of the window and either right click and assign material to selection, or I can go into the little button that should have appeared up at the top of my screen over there, wherever it is. I can't see it now. There we go. Um, where we've got the ability, there we go, to assign material to selection. So I generally prefer just right-clicking and assigning material to selection. And we should see that in on screen that has now changed its appearance ever so slightly. And I'll do the same for the blade and assign the, the metal material to it. For the two grips, I'm going to control click to select both of them at once, select the rubber material and assign to my selection, the left part and the right part. I'm going to assign the glossy yellow, orange color. Um, and then I've remembered just now that I uh, left one material out and that's the backdrop of the, um, the, the environment itself because we, uh, currently it's just a dark background and we don't maybe necessarily want that. We want to have a nice light and black background that can um, start to scatter the light ever so slightly as well. So just add one more material in here and go for a fairly um, standard one. Maybe go for a bit of a matte paint. Just it's got a bit of texture in the background as well. And I'm just going to have it as light as possible. And I'm just going to assign that to my line object. So we've got a nice white background for there. So I'm going to close my material window down. You can see we can always grab that again by tapping M on our keyboard. So if we ever want to make tweaks to the, um, the coloring or the textures or anything like that along the way, we've got the ability to do so. So now we've got our environment set up um, pretty much how we want to once more. Um, we then want to start to um, obviously get an output from this. So the best way to do that is just to set up a configurable camera. Um, so we're going to have a camera that we add to the environment that we can start to um, move around rather than looking through our perspective view, though we can create renders through the perspective view. We want to have a view that we set um, and keep it in exactly the, the correct positioning. And we can have multiple cameras and choose multiple cameras along the way. So in our add or create tab, I'm going to go over to the camera option. And rather than creating a standard camera, we're going to be using the Arnold renderer today. So we're going to use the Arnold camera for this one. We can either create a VR camera, fisheye camera, spherical camera, or cylindrical camera. I'm just going to create a VR camera. And I'm going to drop it in. I'm going to drop it into this view over here. And currently, it isn't aligned exactly where I want to. Um, so what I can do is just make some adjustments to the view itself. So we've got that one. Um, I'm looking at it from the top view at the moment, and it's pointing straight down. I may want to have a look at it from one of these side angles, like this one. And just rotate that uh, camera around. So using my rotate tool, let's rotate it around. Uh, it looks like it's upside down in that case. So let me use my angle snapping, rotate it like so, and from my top view, rotate it 180 degrees as well, something like that. So now it should be pointing directly at my object. Um, its field of view is quite large in this case. Um, so let's go for a, let's just see here, eye separation, we drop that down ever so slightly, didn't do much. Um, trying to make some adjustments to the feel of the camera. Otherwise, I might just use one of the other cameras. Um, we can then change our, our view from our perspective view in this drop down over here um, to any of the other cameras or perspectives. So I want to grab the cameras and go to VR camera. I just want to see what it looks like. Uh, so that is very wide. Um, we've got the ability to control the amount of um, the, um, the aspect ratio. Um, and field of view as well um, as the ability to dolly the camera as well using our little controls down here at the bottom right. Um, so maybe we want to come in and adjust the um, field of view. It's not going to give me that option in this one, unfortunately, but it should give me the ability to adjust the 
dolly of the camera. Let me try the field of view as well and just set this ever so slightly so I'm getting a bit more of the object inside of that. Um, and you can see how that then adjusts um, in each of the other views. We've got the uh, field of view uh, showing on the side over there. Um, in this case, I want to maybe dolly out a little bit more. Grab that camera. Oh, way too far. Something a bit like that if I wanted. Otherwise, I can also control those inside of the 3D space as well. So I can use my move um, tools and actually move this around. And you can see how it's moving in space as well. So if I want to make minor tweaks to it and, and very precise tweaks to it, I can come and zoom all the way in and make sure that this is um, behaving in the way I want to, whether I'm wanting to adjust its positioning in the Y or X or whether I'm wanting to adjust its positioning in the Z as well. So I've got the ability to do that. And maybe for this particular one, we want to have it just ever so slightly off to the side. And uh, we grab it in this view over here. If it will respond, there we go. Um, ever so slightly off to the side and maybe rotate it around ever so slightly as well. Something a little bit like that. Cool. So we've got our camera set up. We then want to also set up some lighting. Um, at the moment, it doesn't have any lighting in the scene. So if we had to try and render this, it's not going to pick up any lighting whatsoever. Um, so in this case, we want to go in and again, hit our Create um, tab and add in some extra lights. Again, we want to use some Arnold lighting for this particular one. Um, we can come in and grab an Arnold light in here. And I can come in and add it to the front view just straight directly above my component here. So I'm going to add it in there and direct it straight down from there. I can have it targeted if I wanted to, so I can um, add a bit of um, direction to it. Um, otherwise, if I untarget it, um, it'll just be pointing straight down and, and we won't need to control the direction of it using the target. Um, I quite prefer using the uh, the target so we can actually control exactly where it's pointing to rather than changing the angle of the, the camera itself. Um, so now if I had to select the main, sorry, the camera, the light, wherever I move it to, it's always going to be angled towards that particular um, section of my component. Um, if I had it untargeted, we could rotate the, uh, the direction around if we ever needed to. Cool. So I've got that one there. We can then go in and start adjusting this light so we can make various changes to it. Um, so in the modify tab once more, I can come in and again here I've got the ability to have it light on or off. Um, I've got the ability to have it targeted or not. I can also come in and change the shape of the light. So at the moment it's a quad, um, which basically can give us a square light above the object itself, but we can also have it as a spotlight um, or a spot. Um, we've also got the ability to have it as a sky dome, which creates a bit more um, of a almost an off um, off centered um, lighting sphere basically around the object. We've also got the ability to create a disk light and a distant light as well. Um, in this case, I'll keep quad on for this particular one, so I'll leave that in there. We've got the ability to change the um, the spread of it, the resolution of it, um, and a whole lot of other. Um, settings we can start to tweak if you find that certain things aren't quite the way you wanted them to. A little further down we've got the ability to change the color of the light itself so whether it's a white light or one of the presets we can come in and grab fluorescent lights we can grab a white light daylight warm light white fluorescent lights cool white and a whole lot of other um, settings from here from other pre-configured um, light types so in this case maybe I just want to go for a Let's go for a warm white on this one and see how that looks from there. I also want to then make sure that um, I'm not only getting this particular one, but I'm getting a few other lights from different angles just so that the entire object itself is lit up. Um, so if I use shift, if I hold down shift on my keyboard and move my item, it's going to create a duplication of the original one. So I can just come in from here and maybe just go off to the bottom right over there and release my mouse. I've got the ability now, um, so you're holding shift will basically clone the original item. You can either create a copy of it. Um, so once it, it then picks up all of this, the same settings and, and once you place it down, it's then its own individual item. 
or we can create an instance of it. And anything we change in the original item will then be changed in any other instance of that particular item. So we've got the ability to come in and set the instance over there. We could name it if we wanted to, but I'll just keep it to the, um, the original over there. So now if I, again, change anything on this, um, change it from a quad light to a spotlight instead, you can see how the other one changes as well. If I change back to a quad, we've got the ability to have that there. And again, it's also keeping that same, um, the, uh, lost the word now, the, um, the target the same um, throughout that process. So um, we just make one more copy from the top one over here. So I grab that one, shift, hold shift, and move it off to the side somewhere over there. Uh, and for this one, for some reason, the target has changed. So let me just grab its positioning and just adjust the new item very quickly and grab its target and adjust it manually if it will let me. Thank you. I just want to grab the Y. Thank you. That's just allowing me to adjust the one on its own. Um, I'll just rotate it ever so slightly. Being a little difficult on this one. Um, but let's do something like that. So now we've got all the ingredients we really need for the process. We've got the lighting to give the illumination of the environment itself. Um, we've got the object set up with all the materials we want for it. Um, and we've now got the uh, the backdrop at the camera as well during that particular process. So we've got the camera set up. I'm, I'm fairly happy with the positioning of the camera for now. Um, we can always change that at a later point if we wanted to as well. Um, but now that we've got this here, I can go over to my render um, section. So into rendering over here, I can create a render setup. And with this, I can choose the target which I'll keep it as is. So the production, uh, actually, I want to have the active shader on as well. Um, this will just make sure that any shading um, occurs at the same time. Um, we've got the renderer we can choose here. Um, again, I said we'll use the Arnold renderer. So it's just another rendering engine that's installed as part of uh, 3ds Max. And then we can choose the view that we want to render from as well. So I'll go down um, and choose my VR camera. Maybe for the time being, let me just turn the active shader off very quickly, just so that it gives us a quicker render um, rather than what it was giving us there. We've got a whole lot of options we can come in and change here. We've got the ability to change the output size. So this is going to HD video. Um, so it'll be your um, 1280 by 720. Um, otherwise, you've got the ability to come in and set other resolutions that we want for this view. We've got the ability to set how many frames if you were animating this, it would keep them and, and render each individual frame. In this case, we don't need to do that. Um, so I'm not going to tick that section. Um, and we've got a whole lot of other options we can come in and adjust here. And it's really nice um, configuration that we can make adjustments to. But as soon as we're happy with this configuration, we can then go through and hit the render, render button. And we'll then get this little rendering icon appear over here and somehow I've managed to uh, mirror the item. No, uh, I've used the wrong view. Let me just make sure that I'm using the right view. Do, 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 do. Should be that one. Interesting. That doesn't look like the view that I asked it to do. Let me cancel that render very quickly and just make sure we are using the VR camera. Interesting. Try that one more time quickly. Not doing it, no worries. Let me try one more time. Otherwise we go to our backup. And Try that one more time quickly. Doesn't make any change. That's annoying. Have I selected the wrong option here? Probably. Fine. 
What we'll do instead, I have a, another scene that I've created in the background. So let me just open that one up. Um, it's more or less the same setup. Um, so I'm not going to save this. Just open the other one, which is this one. It's back to front, but that's OK. Um, and you can see the configuration is much the same. So we've got our three lights on either side. We've got our camera at a bit of an angle pointing at the object itself. If I now go into my rendering environment, um, we've got the rendering set up over here. Using Quad4 Camera 1, render that off. And you can see now exactly the same materials that I've used in this particular one. So we've got that darker rubber over there on the sides. And we've got our glossy um, yellow paint to the, uh, to the item itself. And then as this render starts to go off to the side of it, just expand this out ever so slightly so we can see this a bit better. You'll we'll start to see a bit of a finish to the um, to the metal itself. So this doesn't have the um, active um, shading on, so that's why we've don't have we've got a little bit of a um, pixelated section over there um, where it doesn't have the active shader on. Um, but we could enable that. It'll just take a bit longer to do this render um, during that process and. Um, as an initial section, um, just wanted to kind of have a look at these, um, this current configuration and make sure that we're happy with that. Um, what I did with this one is instead of a quad lighting, I've done um, spotlights so you can see a bit of shadows in the background as well. So something you could play around with um, is having various shadows in the background for that one. Um, if I cancel that, it has finished. If I close this off quickly. Um, and just change the shader to active shade mode and render that very quickly over there. It might take a little longer, but we should see um, the quality improve ever so slightly as it goes through its um, setup of that. You can see it goes and grabs every single individual pixel or it breaks down the entire scene um, into multiple different groups or grids. Um, and starts to create those um, throughout there. We could also, as we've seen, change the resolution of this. So if we wanted to go for a slightly higher resolution or a different setup, we could easily come in and, and make changes to these um, items along the way. Use iterative uh, rendering mode. If we wanted to change the render type, we could do so. We could change some of the configuration of the Arnold renderer change the ray depth sampling and a whole lot of other configurations. So for those of you that might be a bit more familiar with um, the rendering environment as a whole, we've got a lot of options available to us um, in adjusting this. And it's very different than obviously, as you can see throughout this process to our inventor setup and gives us a lot more control, a lot more options um, for rendering these and getting really nice shadowing um, on the items themselves. So I hope that's been beneficial for you guys um, going through the entire process. I know it's been a bit of a longer one than we usually would go through, but I hope that extra bit of time has been um, added benefit for, for the entire process. Um, as usual, if you have any questions, if you have any issues and want to get in touch with us, feel free to um, do so through our website. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, you can drop a comment. We are monitoring the comments to make sure that we are engaging with as many of them as we can. Um, otherwise, Thank you so much for your time today, and I hope you have a great day further and enjoy playing around in the software. Thank you very much. Bye.